Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. As the world marks Human Rights Day today, it is imperative to reflect on the cardinal principle underlying the United Nations decision to dedicate December 10 every year to human rights issues. The philosophy behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 is encapsulated in Article 1 of the Creed, which says, All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and shall act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Joining us to discuss this and other national issues in Nigeria is public affairs analyst Dr. Uke Ikechukwu. Dr. Ikechukwu, welcome to the show. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, good morning, thank you. Good morning, good to see you. Well, I mean, today is uh, World uh, Human Rights Day, December 10th. And the theme for this year is youth standing up for human rights. And the whole idea by the United Nations is that young people are very essential to sustainable development. And that, look, they, are, they can be constructive change agents uh, in uh, addressing many of the uh, issues that affect us as uh, a community of human beings. Now, what's your assessment of the role of uh, young people in Nigeria? in terms of uh, promoting human rights, in terms of how they are treated, in terms of how they are involved in the developmental process. And I ask this question in the light of the 2019 general elections and the attempt by young people to get involved, and also you know, how young people have also been treated um, after the elections in Nigeria. Well, I think the major issue to start is to start by admitting that young people can only participate if they have capacity. And that capacity means knowledge and access. Young people in Nigeria, the bulk of the youth population in Nigeria does not have the advantage of a very good education or exposure. And so to that extent, we have a, a, what you might call a disadvantaged youth population. At the level of the education, there's not enough going around. If you check the number that apply for JAMB and the number that gets admitted, at the level of employment, a lot of young people who have gone to school or acquired some skill cannot find engagement. At the level of politics, the rules of engagement for politics excludes them. If, for instance, you want to contest elections, the kind of money you will need to put down just to scale the primaries, a lot of young people cannot afford it. And in terms of activism, yes, you can see a lot of young people involved in issues of human rights. But again, at that level, you also find that the effort is often uh, more populist than substantial. They sense correctly that a lot of things are wrong with the country. They believe something should be done about it. They believe correctly, too, that no, we shouldn't keep quiet. But you see, they lack what it takes to create the momentum. And that's why the absence of a senior class of mentors that's why the failure of the older generation to take them by the hand and lead them on the right path is part of the crisis facing young people today. So today is a good day to talk about it and to say that the space needs to be expanded for the young people, but that the young people themselves also need to make efforts, greater efforts at self-development. Absolutely, Doctor. And you mentioned a number of things that are very, very, very near to the truth. They are the truth. And the greatest issue that we're seeing here is the deliberate disempowerment of the youth. Now, the youth are not the only ones who face this problem. Women face this problem as well. But let's focus on the youth and let's focus on that deliberate disempowerment. When in a society where, let's take the not too young to run bill, for example, you have a bill that is passed through that suggests or gives this idea that young people finally have access to the policy. But in reality, it it actually is very far from that because, like you said, young people don't have the money, young people aren't given the support, etc. This just comes down to deliberate disempowerment. So when as a young person you're put into this box, let's say, how does one rise above or crawl out of that box of deliberate disempowerment? Well, if, uh, well, I don't know whether it's rising or crawling, but the important thing is to move out of that, um, that frequency yeah. or um, latitude, if you like. Uh oh, sorry. Are you still talking? Yes, sir. Yes, Please, go ahead, Doctor. Please go ahead. Okay, okay yes. Yeah. I said that the thing is for them to get out of it. Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Now, um, 
for young people to get out of that crisis is not a matter of crying in the papers. First of all, they must sit down and study the environment, have a detailed inventory of the things that are against them, then begin to work out what kind of, rule of rules of engagement can I operate with? Are there people within the system who will understand what I'm saying and leverage me? What time frame should I set to this, my desire to change society? Because you find that even among the young people who are intelligent, who are capable of engaging, because they don't have enough understanding of the operating environment, they set themselves a very short time frame. I want to change Nigeria today. The Nigeria you want to change is in the hands of people who are 10 times more powerful than you, many of whom have no conscience unlike you, many of whom have the money to bury you 10 times over and your entire generation. And so instead of studying the system to know from where to engage, to know what kind of weaknesses could give you an advantage, people jump up and then begin to carry on and see if it can happen in one day. No, the damage is much. And part of what the youths need to struggle to be at home with is a proper understanding of the right template for engagement. Understand the environment, structure it. In the short term, this is what we'll do. So you may say that in the short term, we will bring to public consciousness all the things that are wrong. And in the process, you expand the number of those who understand you, those who don't agree that you'll be so, and you begin to consult at various levels, and the horizon will keep expanding until you have the equivalent of a groundswell that can give you national transformation. But you find that uh, some people, once they have 30 people and they, they give a press conference, or they get 45 people and carry badly written placards and walk around some government establishments, they now carry in their heads the illusion that Nigeria is waiting for them to become president. It doesn't work like that. And that's part of the crisis, the absence of the necessary inner maturity. And also, in this regard, we need to make another distinction. There's a difference between those who are biologically young and those who are really young in ideas. A lot of our young people are also those who are being paid to carry placards for dubious politicians and institutions of state. And so you won't say they are not young, but you will not say that they represent the young, the right values for the present times. So the way to engage is to take the matter seriously. It's not about attracting applause. It's a painful, slow thing that requires diligence, continuous and possibly slow expansion of horizon and converts, and then a building of coalitions over and over. But for now, many of the young actors are acting solo. Each person has his own group, makes his own speech, is the president in his own house, and so they are not building the coalition that will give them the strength to intervene on issues of human rights the way they, they ought to and they should be capable of. Well, I mean, uh, okay, I see that you are very critical of uh, youth engagement in Nigeria. But let's take a specific example, you know, with regard to the United Nations position that young people can be a positive force for change, beginning with just having a voice, speaking up, promoting the freedom of speech and engaging at the level of issues. Um, although you are skeptical about carrying of placards and all of that, but take a movement like the Revolution Now movement, uh, led by uh, Omoyele Shoure, and what has happened since uh, August 5, when uh, the uh, Revolution Now movement staged its first protest in parts of the country. Now, will you say that there is an issue of lack of capacity in this regard, or lack of maturity, or that the problem is actually with the environment, the Nigerian state, the resistance of that class uh, that you defined, uh, which is all-powerful and all-dominant? I, I, I would say, Ruben, I would say that it is all of the above. It is all of the above, in my view, and I will tell you why. The environment is not structured to support the sort of thing that we are seeing coming from um, Am I? Is there a mix-up? Revolution now, movement. Yes, the environment is not structured to support that. That's a simple fact because you have a larger number of people benefiting from, the, from what is wrong and what is going on than those who want to be in favor of it. So it's perfectly understandable. Then, please go back. Recall that my initial, or part of my initial submission was that the youths for now have a duty and they'll be useful in driving popular consciousness. 
in letting all of us know what is wrong and saying it should be changed, and then building a wider number of people who agree with that so that over time it will be possible actually to bring about a change. Now, on the issue of maturity and the timeliness of the revolution, I say yes, there is a challenge of maturity. And uh, why I say so is that you must understand an environment, first have a coalition around yourself and then expand that coalition. You will recall that the moment uh, Shoure made the announcement, there was a breakages within his own ranks. If you look at the structure and spread of that quote-unquote revolution, you will know, or I believe, I mean, for, for, for me, I saw it as something that could have been better planned, that could have had a greater national spread, that could have had more substance than just the media visibility. And to that extent, a revolution is not a joke. And we are dealing with a government that's in power. No government is in power in order to have you remove it. And so you cannot come and complain that I'm not giving you a chance to remove me. I don't want to be removed. So the realism that should accompany a serious um, struggle for revolution, I didn't see it in that engagement. The emotional, psychological, political infrastructure for it also was absent. And among the, the young people, how many? And you talk about, when you talk about how many, it's not about how many can appear on TV or on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, but how many young people in Nigeria were involved in this sort of thing. And, you know, if indeed it's a youth thing, one would have expected that Shoure, vibrant, look at his publication, he's clearly committed to certain values. One would have expected that other related organizations, particularly youth organizations, of which there are hundreds, would have created a powerful coalition. And my question will be, did he attempt to create that coalition and it didn't work? Did he expect everybody to join him because he's talking in the media? Did he expect that the change we need in Nigeria will be brought about on Facebook? Did he expect that he should just endanger himself? If he endangers himself and is killed, the revolution dies. So it's not about populism. It's about what you might call real politics, the ability to engage because you understand your environment. And so my take is that Today will be a good day, given the, what is being celebrated, for somebody like Shore and people in similar positions to sit down and review their strategy. The way we've been going, is that really the best way to engage the Nigerian state of today, where you have a desperate elite, where corruption is legal tender, where leadership recruitment is done by just appointing whoever you like, who may be a complete dunce, but who are sure will deliver money to you when he gets into office? The way to engage with this kind of desperate environment is it by making speeches? Where is the coalition they are building? So one is concerned. First, I share the, the, the well, desire for change. Okay, okay. Um, one is concerned. Sorry, that I have to interrupt you well at this point. Uh, sorry, um, we need to take a short commercial break, and when we return, the conversation will continue. Still, the morning show. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Rise News. We still have Dr. Oke Kachuku with us in our Abuja studios. And we are discussing Human Rights Day today and, of course, the theme around youth participation. Uh, thank you for staying with us, Doctor, on the program. I'd like you to conclude your thoughts. And then after that, I'd like us to discuss the fact that, in fact, I'd like to take us back to this idea of deliberate disempowerment that we're speaking of here, because you're, you're talking about youth participation as though the entire reason and why youths are not necessarily participating doesn't exist. Whereas there is a reason. Youths have been forced to feel as though they can't. Youths don't really know their rights. Youths don't really have knowledge and access, like you stated. So with all of these issues compounding together, can we still really look at young people and say, hey, this is on you? And I say this because in light of recent bills that we have, let's take the hate speech bill and the social media bill. If you recall, earlier on this year, I believe it was on March 26th, the digital media bill was declined by the president. This was a bill proposing internet protection and more freedom of speech for the people. And then we had the proposals come in of the social media bill and the hate speech bill, which basically creates a monopoly around the idea of truth, giving the government the only, um, giving the government the entire power to decide on what truth is. And this is something that directly affects not only journalists, the media, etc., as we speak of, but also young people who are extremely active 
on social media, young people who already feel like they can't express their views, like they don't have that room to have that freedom to express their views. So in light of all of this, how are we really still blaming young people for sitting down and not feeling like they can stand up and speak up? No, the young people are not being blamed. I'm not blaming them. I am only pointing out the challenge in the environment they face and suggesting how they should engage if they wish to succeed. And I'll cite the example of uh, Tambo Mbeki, a former vice president, a former president of South Africa. Mbeki was a young man who planned with his fellow young men to carry out a revolution in South Africa many years ago. They came to Mandela and Becky's father were elders, and they came and told them, we are going to deal with all these white people. And their plan was quite simple. They would set their houses on fire, burn their cars, go around making trouble in the streets. Mandela sat them down and said, listen, young men, your duty for now is to go and prepare yourselves. This is a long drawn out battle that may take 50 years, 20 years or more. Prepare yourselves to be ready for the right time. Because if you go along the lines you're doing, at the most, between now and maybe another one or two years, all of you will have been shot in the streets. Then the next wave of young people after you, by the time we have three waves, the young people available will be about 10, 11 years old. And that's what, shortly, I think a week after that advice, Mandela and Mbeki's father and the others were put in jail. And Mbeki and the others took the advice seriously, went into serious education, became part of an international network. In fact, the young men Mandela spoke to were among those who were involved in negotiating the um, uh, South African independence. So my concern is the need for our youths to prepare themselves adequately. Nobody who is fair-minded would blame them for what? They are handicapped, and the examples everywhere only compound matters for them because the role models are not leading them upwards. Instead, they are leading them downwards. And in, within the context of that, too, you mentioned hate speech. And a lawmaker thinks we should have a commission to monitor hate speech. You see, that is the foolishness <clears throat> that you see in the public domain when ignorance is the basis for a point of view. If you're having a lot of people <laughs> with malaria in an environment, what you do... What, hello? Yes, we're with you. Yeah, what you do is... Yes, what you do is you make sure that mosquitoes don't breed around the environment. You don't flock people who have malaria because they've been bitten by mosquitoes. Hate speech arises from a social situation that makes people find that probably out of frustration, they are no longer able to interface in public conversation in a decent manner. The problem is to find out <clears throat> why things are wrong in the country, not create a commission. In any case, all the laws in the country are sufficient for it. With defamation, character assassination, and the rest of it, disturbance of public peace, you want to go and create a commission with branches all over the country. At the end of every month, you will not have less than 200 to three or 400 million uh, staff salary alone. And what will they be doing? Monitoring hate speech. Instead of creating a policy where hate speech will be unnecessary. Now, assuming even it's ne if it's necessary to do that, then use the National Orientation Agency, which already exists, which has staff, which is already stationed in every local government in the country. So you see the disconnect between the thinking of people who should be making laws and the kind of laws we need. So coming around to how it affects young people, assuming most of the platforms of communication for our young people, is, uh, they're all on the social media uh, handles, and so such a law will affect them adversely. But you see, it is one thing to make a law, it's another thing for that law to be meaningful and useful. The use of prey on frequencies that really cannot be accessed by most of the people in government. You can't, you can't regulate social media. How many people will you arrest and leave others? So let's not assume that that is so much of a handicap to our young people when it is not. What needs to be happening most is intergenerational conversation. Nearly every young person you meet believes he is the person to save Nigeria. He doesn't interface with the others. If you look at the last election... All the people who contested the elections, who can be described as having the same activist, developmental mindset as Shore, they couldn't form a coalition. Each one of them believed he or she was the one Nigeria was waiting for. And that's, again, the folly. Because none of them, if you're contesting to be president in Nigeria, who will man your polling booth in Sokoto? Who will man your polling booth in Zamfara? Who will represent you in um, uh, KB State? 
Who will represent you in uh, Boni? So, and Calabar, these are the things. So, when you have crusaders who mistake themselves for national figures because they have 35,000 followers on Facebook, it tells you the extent of delusion that is part of the consciousness people are trying to bring into what they call a revolution. You must sit down and walk. Votes take place in existing polling booths, not on the internet, not on Instagram, and not on the speeches that you share by video. Every politician needs agents. Those agents, you don't recruit them from um, those who are liking you or following you. In any case, if you say you have 50,000 followers on Facebook, where are they following you to? You say you're mentoring over 100,000 people. They're on Facebook. Some of them are criminals and fraudsters. So you have a new conception of social intervention which has no means of monitoring and evaluation. That's part of the crisis. So as for the fear that, no, the, you cannot drown the young people. My suggestion and my take is that they need to structure their conversation better. At the end of every week, they should be able to say, this is the level at which you've engaged. These are other youth organizations we've conversed with. These are the consensus we've arrived at. I was taking it further the upper week. But they're all mostly operating in silos, and therefore there's no sense of joint engagement. And that's why Shore could be picked up, and there was nobody to bail him for more than a month. That's why Sohore could talk about revolution, and besides him and his followers, all other youth um, activists were not seen to be part of that engagement. It won't go very far. If anything happens to him today, that would be the end of everything connected with him. That's not how these things work. They need to structure better. Well, okay, let's move beyond the theme of the uh, World Human Rights Day, focusing on youth, and talk about the human rights record under the Buhari administration in Nigeria. What's your assessment? Do you think that this is an administration that respects Chapter 4 of the Constitution dealing with fundamental uh, human rights, or you think that there have been too many breaches uh, that would need to be corrected moving forward? Well, I think there have been far too many breaches that need to be corrected. But in the midst of all that, too, I also think that we've not had a particularly law governed society since a democracy. It is convenient for us to look at the more conspicuous actions of government and complain about its inappropriateness and to therefore say that the government itself is not doing a number of things right. That is correct. But more fundamentally, we should look at what you might call the reflexes of political leadership since 1999 and use it as a basis for certain conclusions. Now, law, being law-abiding is not limited to obeying the law in the Constitution, to obeying the enacted rules that are seen to be enforceable in courts. It includes how you behave generally. All our political parties have not been obeying their own party rules in primaries, in succession planning, in zoning, etc. So when you talk about being law-governed, we must first of all bring out the elite as fundamentally not law-governed, as fundamentally not being governed, and as fundamentally ungovernable in their reflexes both within the existing government and those that pretend to be an opposition, but who are actually politicians that are angry that they are not the ones chopping at the moment. So in terms of law, visible response to enacted and decided cases in courts, to enacted laws and decided cases in courts, we can say quite correctly and justifiably that we've had rather too many instances of the Bulgarian administration not obeying court orders and not giving very good reasons for it. And in most cases, carrying on with what can be described as impunity. Yes, that impression exists, but we must also have it on record that is not peculiar to this government. What seems peculiar is the, is the I wouldn't use the word impunity, the, the bold indifference, the total contempt for even a response on most of the issues, and the repeated affirmation, sometimes without explanation, for the line of action they've taken. So yes, we can say that the political space is not particularly fantastic. But quite frankly, between two, 1999 and today, I don't know what there is to choose between the actions of government. In fact, what is going on, what has been going on outside of the domain of obeying or not obeying court orders is responsible for the decay and lawlessness in Nigeria today. So if you isolate the Buhari government based on not obeying court decisions, the observation is correct. They have disobeyed too many court decisions. But this government came in after 16 years of total political lawlessness and civil indiscipline in self-management, 
poor recruitment templates in political parties, irresponsible administration of public funds, sporadic uh, use of uh, national uh, funds, that we began to see in Nigeria where there's a budget, and you go to spend the budget, they tell you the money has gone. Why did he go? Somebody correct, collected authority to incur expenditure in order to spend money for which. So it is a total disorder. And if we focus only on obedience to court or laws, court orders or not, we overlook the fact that everything needed to make create responsible citizens is being destroyed by the political and the civil and economic misconduct of the political elite. So I want us to disaggregate that. Yes, this government has a disastrous record in terms of ob obedience to court orders, but the, the matter is far too serious to be left at the table of uh, obeying or not obeying court orders. How are local government chairmen behaving? How are the members of the state houses of assembly behaving? How are the governors behaving? How are the ministers? You have to uh, with closing. And thank you very much, Mr. Ogbe. Uh, for your insights. Absolutely. I'm sure we'll be inviting you again because there are still so many other issues that we can talk about. Thank Definitely. you very much. Have a great day.